And after I got saved, I decided I wanted to be just as fervent for the Lord as I was for the devil. And every Christian ought to be fervent for the Lord. Brother Marcus is fervent for the Lord. Now, you know who he is. I, I got to do the formal introduction. And our folks here at Liberty, where he's a member, know Brother Marcus, and, and, uh, and we love him. He's just, uh, he's fit in right from the very beginning. And, uh, and Brother Al is, uh, is a very special uh, member to us also. And I, I love the both of them. And when Brother Marcus surrendered to preach, uh, made my heart just kind of do flip-flops like that. That's, that's special. It's special to see somebody surrender to the will of God. I can tell you this about Marcus. I've known him for less than a year, but I know him well enough already to know that he loves God. Now, he loves God. I, I mean it. He loves God. And, uh, and he loves the Word of God. And he surrendered his life to preach the blessed old book. And uh, he's been looking forward to this night, and we've been looking forward to this night. And if you feel like saying amen every once in a while, while he's preaching, just let her rip. Just go ahead. Let's, in fact, let's practice on it on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen. Hey, that's pretty good. I like that. Yeah. Brother Marcus Gaskin, come and preach what the Lord has laid on your heart. First and foremost, I just want to thank God. Um, you know, about two and a half years ago, you know, He saved my soul, and I certainly didn't deserve it. But you know, I'm thankful that He did. And uh, I, uh, like you said, I, uh, I'm trying to do my best to try to love God. Now I've uh, been on the wrong side for so long, and just trying to be a blessing, trying to be a help to anybody that I can. And uh, I'm going to thank my parents. Uh, hey, that's all right. Man. They, uh, they've always been great for me, and I've, I thank God up for them often. I, mean, I thank God for y'all. Um, all of my family, I love y'all. I, uh, I don't know what to do without you. And um, I want to thank Liberty Baptist. Uh, the first time I walked in the doors in January early this year, y'all just made me feel welcome and feel at home. And uh, Pastor, I want to thank you. I, I don't know if God twisted your arm or not, but for having enough trust for asking me to get up here. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you wanted the night off, but yeah, thank you for letting me get up here. And, uh, I just I want to thank everyone for coming to support me tonight. I uh, I'm thankful that God has brought you. I'm going to try to do my part to deliver the word of God. And I'm just thank you and God bless you. Let's pray. Uh, uh, Father, Father, I pray that we do Your will tonight. No one else's. I uh, I pray that You use me to deliver Your word how You want me to, Lord. And I just uh, pray that Your presence be here with us, Lord, and please use me. And uh, if anyone has any business to do with You today, I pray that it's taken care of today, Lord. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation. I pray that it may be for today for anybody who may need it, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray this. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to um, start out in Acts chapter 16. chapter 16 is this one on too? this one's on we're good okay I'll try that better is this one on here? okay alright Acts chapter 16 verse 16 Need some more time or everyone there? Okay. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Uh, this woman, uh, she was a fortune teller, and she made a lot of money for her masters by telling people's fortunes. Um, verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. Now, this damsel, she was possessed with the demonic spirit, and she was following these men around. What she was saying, you know, was actually true. She was saying that these men were the servants of the God, and that they were trying to preach the way of salvation. And uh, you may be wondering, well, why, why would this damsel be saying this? And um, I believe that the spirit that was in the damsel, she was basically, she was trying to discredit these men in the word of God. Um, you know, everyone knew that the damsel, that she was a worldly, sinful person, and that this spirit, she could have associated them together and made it seem like they were on the same team, then uh, 
and you know most most people they would just automatically discredit these men and what they were saying and uh, something Christian something we can learn from that is um, you know we need to be careful who and what we associate ourselves with uh, you know we need to make it clear you know whose team that we're on um, you know if we want to be effective for God then we don't need to behave like the world does And then, um, let's see, verse 18, and this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, Paul got annoyed with the damsel, and uh, so he commanded the spirit to come out of the damsel. And, uh, verse 19, and when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Um, in verse 19, we see here that the damsels, masters, they were upset that their way of making money was taken away. And um, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, God says that, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. These men, they loved right. money. They didn't care if they were getting it in a sinful way. They didn't care if they were hurting this damsel or anyone else. They just wanted their money. All right, verse 20 and 21. And brought them to the magistrates, Paul and Silas, they were brought to the magistrates, saying, these men being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. These damsel, the damsel's masters, they brought Paul and Silas to the authorities, and they said that the customs that they were teaching, that it was illegal according to Roman law. At this time, they were under Roman control. The Roman Empire was thriving. And also keep in mind, remember in verse 19, it says that they were upset that their way of making money was taken away. But when they brought these men before the authorities, you notice how they said, these men, they're being, being Jews, they're teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe them. We see that same kind of attitude in people today. Basically what they were saying, these men were preaching the word of God, and people, even to this day, they do not want to hear the word of God, and they especially do not want to do the word yeah. of God. That, so they tried to get these men in legal trouble. They didn't bring up the real reason why they had brought these men to the authorities. Verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Paul and Silas had their clothes torn off. They're about to be beaten. Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Um, these men, they had just been beaten. They had been cast into prison. And in the next verse here, we're going to see how these men respond. Verse 25, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, Christians, that's something we can learn from this. Now, we can praise God no matter what we're dealing with in life. And uh, you also notice here it says, And the prisoners heard them. You never know who's watching and what it's going to lead to. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Paul, all the doors were open, everyone's bands were loosed. Paul and Silas and the other prisoners. And, uh, verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. This jailer, he had been asleep. At midnight, an earthquake happens. He wakes up, he sees all the doors open. He automatically assumes that everyone had fled. Now, had this man, if he had lost any of his prisoners, more than likely he would have been killed himself, possibly even tortured. So I guess he was just wanting to go ahead and get it out of the way. Then uh, verse 28. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now, to keep in mind now, all the doors open, everyone's bands were loose, a prison full of criminals. And then, and of course, there are some Christians here, too. But like these men, they had opportunity to leave, but they didn't. And, um, you know, earlier we went over that how Christians, how we need to believe, behave differently than how the world behaves. And when we do that, God can use those opportunities to catch someone's attention. And then we're also about to see an example of that. Verse 29, then he called for a light, referring to the jailer, and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. I'm sure that the jailer was wondering, you know, why these men, why they didn't run when they had the opportunity. Uh, he realized something was different about these men. And I also tend to believe that I'm sure this jailer, 
he more than likely he knew why these men were in prison. And um, in verse 21, you remember it said that they were teaching customs. Basically, they were teaching the word of God. So these men, they already had a reputation with this jailer. But then the jailer, he got to see these men behaving differently. When their reputation, when their actions matched up with the reputation, excuse me, I'm sorry, when their actions matched up with the reputations, so God used that to get his attention. And then uh, here in verse 30, I see what I believe is to be the most important question that any man could ask. Remember this jailer, he was about to commit suicide. He was about to kill himself. Paul cried out, he stopped him. He said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. In verse 30, the jailer, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In uh, verse 31, we see what their answer is. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. This man, he asked what he needed to do to be saved. He may have expected them to, you know, say he had to do some kind of great thing or maybe even get baptized in water or maybe even be a good person. They just simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, in the next few verses, we're going to read this man and his family. They did get baptized in water, but this was after they were saved. Verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Remember, they had many stripes on them when they got beaten. The jailer, he washed their stripes. Then after that, and was baptized, he and all his, uh, straightway. And um, just a side note, I want to um, uh, speak to fathers for just a minute. You notice how this man got saved and also his family got saved? You know, his fathers, uh, we need to take the first step. You know, if we want to see our families in heaven, you know, we need to get saved first. And then we can lead our family the rest of the way. Now, next, um, I want to focus on what God meant when he said believe in verse 31. Um, I wasn't saved until I was 25 years old. Before that, you know, I believed that Jesus existed. I believed that he was the son of God. You know, I even believed that this Bible here was the word of God. But the kind of belief that I had before I was saved, it was not the kind of belief that's going to get us into heaven. And um, I'd like to read James chapter 2, verse 19 to you. James chapter 2, verse 19. And it reads, Thou believest that there was one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And um, I, I wanted to bring this verse up to just basically point out that um, you know, just simply the believing that Jesus exists is not what's going to get us into heaven. Uh, I want to share some of my personal story when I got saved and uh, some verses that helped me realize that what I had was not salvation. Um, um, before I was saved, before I was born again, if I had died, I wasn't exactly sure where I would have ended up. I was, uh, you know, I was confused. I, uh, and one of the verses that helped, one of the verses that helped open up my eyes was, um, it was First John chapter five, verse thirteen. I want to read that one to you. First John chapter five, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Clearly we see here that it is possible to know whether or not we have eternal life. Before I was saved, I didn't know, I wasn't sure about it. Uh, the night that I was saved, the man that led me to Christ, he asked me if I had ever been saved, and I told him yes. I told him when I was 12 years old, I was saved and I was baptized. And then after that, he um, he opened up 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He read this verse to me and he asked me when I was 12 years old, did anything like this happen to me? You know, and I thought about it, you know, my answer was no. Um, you know, 13 year old Marcus was just the same as 12 year old Marcus, nothing had changed for me. There was nothing life changing, nothing old passed away, nothing became new. And you know, while um, the more verses this man was reading, just the more, I just, I had this guilty feeling came over me. I didn't know it at the time, but it was conviction from God. 
And then uh, let me share another verse with you. Uh, James chapter 2, back in James. James chapter 2, verse 17. And it reads, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now before I was a born again believer, I used to claim that I was a Christian. I used to say that I had faith, but I, have no, but I had no works. And here God says that that kind of faith is dead. I had no kind of saving faith. And at that time I wasn't working for God, and actually I was working for the devil, even, even though I didn't realize it. Uh, you know, God clearly says that we cannot serve two masters. Um, back before I was saved, now I would be in a club on Saturday night and then sometimes I'd go to church Sunday morning. You know, it doesn't work that way. You know, I was only fooling myself. I wasn't tricking God. Um, and um, before I was saved, I used to think that I was an okay person. What I would do is um, I would compare myself to other people and I would use that to kind of, you know, elevate myself and to somewhat justify myself. And, um, you know, as people, we have a tendency to think that our sins is not as bad as someone else's sins. But, uh, um, let me, we're going to go up a couple of verses to James chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. I'm going to show you what God thinks about that. James chapter 2, verse 10, it reads, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art to become a transgressor of the law. All right, what God's saying here, basically one sin makes you guilty of breaking all God's laws. Um, there is no such thing as a worse sinner as another in God's eyes. Now, I know we as people, now, I may look at somebody, well, I used to. I'm, try, I'm a lot better about it now, but uh, I would look at somebody, and I'm like, well, I don't do the things that they do, so, you know, if I die, God may let me into heaven. You know, I'm an okay person. You know, why would God not let me in? You know, I'm doing better than what they're doing, but obviously, you know, God... It, it doesn't matter what I thought. It doesn't matter what anybody else thought about me. You know, God is the judge. I'm not the judge, and no one else is. So that's why it's important to know what he says about the situation. And then after this, the night that I was saved, my old preacher, he shared some verses with me out of the book of Romans. And um, I want you to turn there with me. We're going to start in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I want to start in verse 10. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. God says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, if you will, skip down to verse 23 with me. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says that there are no righteous people, and we've all sinned and come short of his glory. Like once we accept that, then it's possible to realize that we need a savior. Like these verses sure helped me the night that I was saved. Like I, I knew that I had sinned. I knew that I was a sinner. But uh, the night this man was witnessing to me, I, like all of a sudden, like I realized I sinned against God, and I didn't. Um, I didn't realize how bad it was in the eyes of God. And like I say, I was trying to justify myself by comparing myself to others. But um, basically, here God simply says, you know, like for all of sin, it comes short of the glory of God. And then uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. This one really spoke to me the night that I was saved. Romans 6, 23, it reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, wages, now, if you work for an employer, you know, when you get your paycheck, that's a wage. You know, wage is something that we earn. God is saying, basically, we earn death by sinning. But the gift of God is eternal life. A gift, well, a good gift is uh, something someone pays for and they give to you. Jesus Christ, he paid for our sins on the cross. Right. Uh, and um, God, and God, God freely gives us eternal life once we believe, like on his son and the work that he did on the cross. Now, um, if you will, skip over to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 with me. Now, the night that I was saved at this point, by the time this man had read, shared in some of these verses with me, I'm like, I'm really feeling guilty. I like I had this sense of a conviction come over me. And um, I wasn't exactly sure what, 
at the time I wasn't exactly sure what was going on, but you know, I, I just I knew something wasn't right. And um the more the more verses this man was reading with me, the more I just realized, you know, I was on that highway to hell and it, it was nothing to sing about. And I know they got a song about it, but um Romans ten nine that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Sa salvation, it's a heart transaction. Before I was saved, like, I had knowledge of God here in my head, but I didn't have knowledge of God here in my heart. And the night that I was saved, you know, God, he, just, he really spoke to my heart, and I realized that I had sinned against God. I realized that I needed a Savior. And then um, I'm getting close to the end here, but I want to share two more verses with you. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God simply says here, we're saved by grace through faith. You know, grace, I like to define grace as, you know, something that we don't deserve. And like neither, none of us, none of us deserve salvation. Saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, there's no good work. There's nothing that I can help God do to save my soul. Um, if I could work my way into heaven, then it basically would be no point in what Jesus did on the cross. Um, if, we, if we could be good enough to get there, there'd be no point of doing what he did. And here again, remember in Romans, you know, it says salvation is the gift of God. We see that here again. And then verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, if salvation was a works, God was saying men will be bragging about it. And then um, if I could work my way into heaven, I would be basically, it would kind of lead to me being like a self-righteous person. I'd be telling other people how good I am and, you know, what I did to get into heaven. And I'm, uh, and honestly, I'm sure glad that, that God did not base salvation on works because, you know, as we read earlier, you know, God says there is none righteous. It's not possible for us to be good enough to get to heaven. And, um... All right, and I'll close with this. That's all I have prepared for you tonight. And, um, you know, I sure am thankful that my old preacher came to the house that night and told me how to be saved. And, um, you know, had he not, more than likely, I still would have been walking around like a lost person. I, um, like, even when I was a young child, I used to pray. I used to pray to God, and I wanted to help people. You know, when I was younger, I would think that once I got older, if I ended up making a lot of money, that I could help people that way. But, um, now, I thank God it's seeming like he's answered my prayer, but not in the way how I want it to be answered. Uh, you know, I thank God he's put me in this position here. Um, you know, if you love somebody, try to help them get to heaven. I mean, you know, once we get to eternity, we'll be able to realize how short this life here on earth was. Um, and I know that's all that we know now because that's all that we've experienced. But, I mean, there's coming a day and time when, you know, I, I don't want any regrets. You know, my family, I love y'all, not even if you're my family. I mean, my fellow man, I love y'all. That's why I'm up here. I'm trying to tell you the word of God. I'm trying to tell people how to get to heaven. I mean, I still have a lot to learn, but, you know, I'm trying to do what I can do. You know what I'm I, I love you guys. Um, uh, let's pray. That's all I have prepared for you. Um, Father, I pray that I did your will tonight. I, um, Father, for those of us that are already born again Christians, I hope I could, I hope I shared something that will help motivate someone or and just help in any way. You know, as Christians, we need to help other people become Christians. Father, if there's anyone here who is not a Christian, I, pr I pray and ask that you would put that on their heart. And I pray that if anyone here is in that situation, Lord, I pray and ask that they would take care of it tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray that. Amen. Would you bow with me, please, and let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going we're gonna to give an invitation. After a sermon like that, there ought to be an invitation. Brother Marcus gave you the pure word of God. That's how to be saved. And I, I honestly believe that across America, there's a whole lot of folks that are in exactly the same shape that Marcus was in before he got saved the shape that I was in before I got saved. We have a form of religion, but religion can't save anybody. One thing saves people. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he was preaching tonight. 
there in Romans chapter 10. Now we're going to have the pianist to play in just a minute, and we're going to invite you to come if you need to come to an altar. But in Romans chapter 10, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call in on the Lord out of a pure heart, believing the right thing. Marcus said he believed before, but he didn't believe in the Bible way. Believing that Jesus exists is not quite enough. To believe on him the Bible way means you put your trust in what he did on the cross of Calvary. That he died in your place for your sins. It's a personal thing. Nobody can get saved for you. Salvation is not inherited. And you don't become a Christian just because you go to church any more than you become a car when you walk into a garage. You get saved when you make a conscious decision to trust Jesus to forgive and wash away your sins once and for all forever. As she plays, I invite you to come. You can just kneel. You may be a Christian tonight and maybe, maybe you just need to come and kneel at this altar. These steps here will just turn it into an altar. And you may need to ask God to do something special in your life. There may be something that God spoke to you about. Maybe you've got one foot in the world and one foot in the church house and your faithfulness is divided. Jesus said you can't be loyal to two masters. It's one or the other. It's about time some of you decided I'm getting my foot out of the world and I'm getting both feet planted firmly in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian and you've been divided loyalties, why don't you come and just make that decision tonight? If you're here and not saved, sweet friend, I want you to know something. Listen closely. Jesus loves you. And somebody had to pay for those sins. If you're not saved tonight, you've just been playing like a Christian. Why don't you realize tonight that Jesus paid the price for your salvation because he loves you. And if you'll take one step towards him, he'll take two towards you. Let me ask you this, while we're, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, there's pe still people praying at the altar. Let me ask you this, nobody's looking around but the preacher. If you've never been saved, I mean really genuinely born again. You've never been saved, but you're concerned about it tonight. I'd like to just make a mental 